Oh, hi. You just caught me watching one of my all-time favorite shows. For me, it's HBO's The Sopranos. It's gotta be one of the greatest shows ever made. I couldn't tell you how many times I've seen it. You know, sometimes when I'm done watching a show or playing a game, I like to go online to check to see if there have been any creepypastas written about it. Now, what is a creepypasta, you might be wondering, if you're like 48 years old or something? Well, basically, they're horror stories written by 14-year-olds. Kind of like the modern, digital age version of a campfire ghost story. And frankly, some of the funniest shit I've ever read in my entire life has been from a creepypasta. Something you'll immediately notice as you dive into the genre of creepypasta is that most of them seem to be slight variations on the exact same story. Someone buys a game in a yard sale, only things aren't quite as they seem. It begins glitching out in increasingly spooky ways before it's revealed that it's haunted by the ghost of a dead child or some other such nonsense. This kind of got me thinking. Which actual game is closest to replicating the creepypasta experience? Some of you might be thinking, oh, it's that dumb Slenderman game, right? Uh, no. I mean, think about it. How many creepypastas begin with, I was just sitting down to play my official Slenderman brand horror game when suddenly something spooky started happening. You see, the first step in creating creepypasta is you have to pick a game that isn't spooky, like Pokemon or something. Now, if you haven't seen all six seasons of The Sopranos, I'm gonna need you to stop the video right here. Please go watch the entire show, then come back and unpause the video. Now I want to be perfectly clear, this is not a spoiler warning, there will be no spoilers of any kind in this video. Rather, this is simply a direct order. You are not allowed to watch the rest of this video until you've seen The Sopranos, so please, go do so now if you haven't. Alright, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the show. Now, some of you might be slightly upset to hear that the rest of this video actually has nothing to do with The Sopranos whatsoever. I just thought you might enjoy watching it. I mean, it's a really good show. I was just trying to enrich your life, so when you think about it, can you really get mad at me? No. No, you can't. Sonic fan games have a long and storied history. Ever since the long Sonic drought during the Saturn era, fans of the series have been making and sharing their own games with mercifully little pushback from Sega, who have a much more laissez-faire attitude compared to some other companies. One such game was Sonic Gather Battle. A fan game built on the game engine for Little Fighter 2, a freeware beat-em-up from Hong Kong. Gather Battle was created by a Taiwanese dev named Li Mena Dan back in 2009 and was updated sporadically over the years. It's essentially just a beat-em-up starring Sonic characters. I mean, it's not terrible or anything, but it's nothing special really. On December 11th, 2017, a post was made on the Sonic the Hedgehog subreddit warning people about supposedly malicious DRM contained within the game, which was put in place after an update on December 4th. There were a number of ways to activate it, from trying to modify the game with a cheat engine, to just transferring your save to another computer. Once the DRM is activated, the stage gets super dark and spooky music plays. It's actually just the music from The House of Mirrors and Amy's version of Twinkle Park and then these invincible red ghosts start spawning in and begin to attack you. I mean, that's a little spooky, I guess. Technically the game's not unplayable or anything, it's just a huge pain in the ass now. Doesn't seem that bad, right? Trust me, this is just the tip of the iceberg. If you go into the registry manager and try to undo the red ghost protection, it gets even worse. When you try to play the game now, red static fills the screen and the US version of the Sonic CD boss music plays. Also, these spooky red eyeballs begin to spawn around, and even spookier ghosts come and instantly kill you. Then the screen reads, you died, and you're unable to do anything but exit the program. So what exactly is the problem? Just seems like a spooky way to prevent people from cheating, right? Well, the so-called anti-cheat measures this program uses are actually quite invasive. For starters, when being installed, the game asks for administrator access. As a general rule of thumb, do not give admin access to random files you download off the internet. In addition to this, the game will not run if the computer isn't connected to the internet. And that's not the only suspicious behavior. Upon installation, the game will secretly open whatsmyip.org and then sends your IP address to a server that the game is connected to, which the creator can use to remotely disable the game via a blacklist file. Another highly suspicious thing the game does the first time it's opened is it creates a file called b.dll, reads it, then immediately deletes it. Eventually someone noticed that if the game is running and you try to search Google for words like cheat, hack, or mod, the game will automatically force close your web browser. API investigations determined it was actually scanning window names. Any window or program with certain keywords like cheat will automatically be closed. It also apparently scans your search history, presumably also for these words. Uninstalling and reinstalling won't work. 
The only way to have this stupid ghost shit removed from your game was to track down the creator and then explain to him why you should be removed from the blacklist and allowed to play the game again. But why do all this? What was the reason for this guy to be so insanely protective of this game? Well, it turns out the whole thing was over paranoia that people were gonna rip and steal his sprite edits. Not even original art assets, all this insane bordering on malware-esque security measures was to protect sprite edits. There was a lot of misinformation and exaggerations floating around at the time, saying shit like this game could destroy your whole computer or whatever. Luckily a fellow by the name PCO, who happens to be the owner of Sonic Fan Games HQ and Sage, the Sonic Amateur Games Expo, decided to post a write-up that clarified a lot of the details about this whole ordeal. Working with the Sonic Stuff Research Group, Gather Battle was thoroughly dissected. Ultimately it doesn't actually do anything damaging to your computer as far as they can tell. It really is just an insane person's extremely overzealous copy protection. So credit to Sage, the shit was discovered nearly immediately and the creator was obviously permanently banned from participating. Don't let this deter you from the idea of downloading fan games. Just use common sense when downloading files from random people off the internet, like don't give fucking admin access to a fan game and you'll be fine. The funniest thing is that despite all his effort, someone decided to rip all the sprites from the game and post them on the Mugen archive, just to spite him. And you better believe I downloaded them. Yeah, I'm never gonna use the fucking things, I just wanna have them because I know he wouldn't want me to have them. Oh, and speaking of Mugen, that's actually what this video is about. Don't I fucking hate when you're watching a video and some moron ruins it with a live action skit? You know what I'm talking about, guys like Nostalgia Critic and, uh, you know, Nostalgia Critic and others. They're almost never funny and they always ruin the flow of the video. It's like, come on asshole, just get back to reviewing the fucking thing already. You've probably heard of Mugen before. I mean, even before Salty Bed, it wasn't exactly obscure. But I'm gonna explain what it is anyways, because to be honest, Mugen is just one of those things that's fun to explain. It's basically a fighting game where you can play as anyone. It's technically a freeware fighting game engine that uses player-created characters and stages. And over the years, there's been an ungodly amount of content created for it. You see, the fighting game genre has had a long history of crossover games dating back to... Uh... Well, it doesn't matter. See, the point is now we have Mugen. It's the ultimate crossover game. Mugen stands for... Well, it doesn't stand for anything, apparently. It's just the Japanese word for infinity. I don't understand why they chose to stylize the title like it's an acronym. I guess they just wanted it to look cool. With Mugen, you can make almost any two fictional characters fight. For example, you could have Homer Simpson vs. Wolverine, or 3D Homer vs. Boneclaw Wolverine, or, uh, Evil Homer vs. Pocket Wolverine. I mean, seriously, any combination of characters. The only limit is your imagination. Hell, you can even play as a creepypasta. Some of these guys even come with fucking screamers built in. But that's not why I decided to bring it up. I'm not knowledgeable enough, nor do I care enough to do a deep dive into it, but let's just say the Mugen community is prone to drama. People get very, very protective over their characters, and people also get very angry over which site to use. But in this day and age, it pretty much seems like MugenArchive.com is one the great Mugen warehouse war. It's got a nice selection of characters, but oh my god, I don't want to post on your forum, just let me download the fucking files! Obviously with user-created content, the quality can vary wildly between characters. That's kind of the fun, though. I was never a huge fighting game guy. I mean, I like them well enough, I have fun playing them, I just never got super good at any one in particular. So if you're a fan of fighting games, you might not enjoy playing Moogan as much as a real fighting game which was designed and balanced by professionals. Me, I just like watching the weird characters fight each other. Somehow the novelty just never wore off for me. You can literally just watch this shit all day long and still find it funny. Yep, that's still funny. Maybe with how big Smash Bros has gotten, the idea of a fighting game with tons of different characters from wildly different universes has become slightly less unique. But the first version of Mugen came out in July 1999, just six months after Smash 64, and well before Brawl came along and added third parties into the mix. So for a long ass time, if you wanted to watch Sonic fight Mario, this was the only way to do it. Outside of old Flash cartoons on Newgrounds and Albino Black Sheep. And Smash is great and all, but because of the way Mugen's structured around user-created content, literally any character is on the table. It's not even limited to the realm of video game characters. God damn it, you know, you're never gonna get in a Smash if you can't even beat the peanut butter jelly time banana. 
One of the more infamous characters associated with Mugen is the character Donald, created by Japanese user Kishio. An original character, well I mean he's not 100% original for the ground up, technically he's based off some edited Dio sprites and some other characters, but he's a wide array of McDonald's themed moves and tons of sound clips from those Japanese commercials everyone loves. He's a very strong character with a notoriously brutal custom AI that can pull off insane aerial combos. Wait, why is he called Donald instead of Ronald? Well, in Japan, there's this whole thing with L's and R's, so during the Japanese localization of McDonald's, they decided to just change his name to Donald McDonald to avoid the hassle. He even has a rivalry with Colonel Sanders, because of course there's a Colonel Sanders character. There's even a special intro that plays if you have a match between them. I love that kind of attention to detail. Something interesting about Mugen is the character is allowed to have up to 12 different color palettes to choose from, and you actually program different palettes to have different gameplay properties. For example, Donald's 11th palette is known as Donald Core. He looks exactly the same, but is accompanied by seven AI-controlled clones to absolutely curb stomp the opponent into the ground. However, what really caught my eye was Donald's 12th palette, known as Dark Donald, which has been edited to make an already strong character downright overpowered. In addition to buffed attack and defense, he's now able to jump five times in the air instead of once. His power bar automatically fills up over time. He recovers a small amount of life whenever he attacks or gets hit, and whenever his life drops below 100 it automatically recovers up to that point, meaning he can only be KO'd by a strong attack. Also some of his hypers have become one hit KOs and have an increased number of projectiles. To put it into perspective, Dark Donald can easily take on the Donald core. Anyways, there have been a truly ridiculous amount of edits of this character, along with his rival the Colonel. We've got Ultimate Dark Donald, Golden Donald, Evil Donald, Ice Donald, Shadow Donald, so many fucking Donalds. Like seriously, I don't think you fully grasp just how many Donald edits there are. It's insane. They just keep getting stronger and stronger too. The first thing you might wonder about in a fighting game where you can create characters from scratch is why don't people just create massively overpowered characters which are guaranteed to win? And the answer is, they do. And they get creative with it too. I'll never forget the first super cheap Mugen character I saw, probably the most iconic one, Omega Tom Hanks. A character created as an April Fool's joke by Shinryoga and Mio Ankh. The character lacks any hurtboxes, rendering him impossible to defeat by normal attacks, and he attacks his opponent with DVD covers of Tom Hanks movies until they're dead. His special is a screen-wide, unblockable one-hit KO. That's the kind of character that sticks with you, you know. There are plenty of other great cheap characters too, like Rare Akuma. These characters typically have things like unmanageable attacks, ridiculous one-hit kill hypers, inconsistent or no hitboxes, life that regenerates at an unreasonable rate, etc. It's fascinating watching comically overpowered characters fight. There's something uniquely enjoyable about watching two intentionally unfair fighters try to outcheap each other. And depending on the characters, it can look like the final episode of the world's most insane anime. You never know if the fights are going to last for one second or minutes on end. I think the strongest character I have downloaded in my admittedly meager collection is this dude called Crazy Catastrophe. He's an edit of some guy named Orochi from King of Fighters. Here's how he fares against Base Donald. Yeah, he didn't really put up too much of a fight there. But let's see how Dark Donald manages. Well, that was better than regular Donald. He lasted a few seconds at least. Why don't we try Ultimate Rainbow Donald, one of my strongest Donalds. Damn, you know, I actually thought he might have had a chance there for a second. Alright, enough playing around. Let's see how he does against my strongest Donald edit with the appropriately edgy name Will of Hades. Well, ultimately it turned out to be a stalemate. He even stopped the timer so I had no choice but to manually exit the match. 
Some character creators even built in anti-cheat measures into their characters. They did this by analyzing the stats and the name data of the opponents, and then checking the values to see how much they deviate from the normal 1000 life, 3000 power, and 100 attack and defense, as well as checking the character's name against an internally programmed database of cheap characters, as well as cheap character creators. If any of these triggers are detected, the character will engage their own cheapness countermeasures, usually an instant kill or becoming invincible by either health regen or hitbox removal. But you need to understand, there is a level beyond Omega Tom Hanks. A character with zero hitbox to attack, I mean that's it right, how do you get stronger than that? Well, for a while that pretty much was it. Then eventually these two guys, Troy and Tony, released a character called the Second Death Star, which was a cheap character similar in design to Omega Tom Hanks, but has a special reversal kill code programmed to beat him. To get around the fact Omega Tom Hanks has no hitboxes, complex workarounds must be used, typically via glitches like state overflow or null reversals which force him into a custom state without actually having to make contact with an attack. A lot of these methods relied on glitches only found in older versions of the game, however some working methods still exist and can be used to this day such as reversal death, and thus the Omega Tom Hanks killer class of character was born. The most powerful characters in Mugen are known as Cheapies. I did not make that up, according to the Mugen database that so that's actually what they're called. Not to be confused with cheap characters, a cheapy, also known as cheapo or uber cheap character, is a type of character that far surpasses the cheapness levels of a regular cheap character, instead using code that breaks characters rather than overpowered moves and a lack of hitboxes. It was upon reading this page and stumbling across the list of types of cheapy that I knew I had to make a video about this, because this shit is fucking wild. Unfortunately, due to the nature of characters that modify external files outside of Mugen, these characters aren't even allowed to be linked on Mugen database, so I won't be able to show you direct footage of a lot of these types, and indeed a lot of these fights are over after one frame anyway, so there wouldn't be much to show in the first place. This sense of verboten knowledge just adds to the sense of mystery. For a lot of these high tier cheapy characters, the only way to get a hold of them is to track down the original author and offer to trade a similar character. I thought long and hard about the best way to present this information, but I finally realized I simply have no choice but to read you the tier list as it appears on the wiki page verbatim. Anything else would simply be diluting its majesty. I need you to experience this information the exact same way I did. So here it is, divided into 16 tiers of ascending power level. Nuke tier characters, which don't use any special files. These characters do not use null methods to KO the opponent, and as such lose to most null tier characters. Consider the safest cheapy to download since it doesn't rely on external files or exploits. Null tier characters, which use exploits in the engine to KO the opponent, such as the percent end bug or the direct death alive change. Void tier characters, which utilize an overflow in a cert to clipboard and display to clipboard to defeat the opponent. Secretary tier characters, which use an exe to trick Mugen. More specifically, these characters' exe files act as a trainer, modifying the opcodes and memory values found in Mugen to make KOing the enemy easier. Postman tier characters, which use a bat file. In most cases, this replaces the enemy with a far weaker character which comes with the Postman character itself. Assembly tier characters, which come with an alternate Mugen.exe. This is exactly the effects you'd expect. Super Null tier characters, which use a method known as State Def Overflow, or the Feye method. This causes the character to be able to inject its own code into Mugen by utilizing a large enough State Def via overflowing a memory region found within Mugen. Receiver tier characters, which use a Java powered Mugen to make other cheapies, including itself, balanced. Letter tier characters, which use a VBS file. This is often combined with a postman method. Omed tier characters, which essentially use state def overflow, except with their own separate exe, bat, or similar file. Whale tier characters, which aren't really characters as much as they are websites. When loaded, at its weakest, a video of the cheapie is open winning the match and at its strongest, downloads a character and opens Mugen. Hyper Null tier characters, which use a method known as Heap Overflow to overflow Mugen with useless memory until it reaches the character's own code. After the code is executed, the character starts Mugen normally. Frost tier characters, which are upgraded versions of Omed tier characters in terms of coding. These characters use C Sharp rather than Mugen's standard C as their programming language, and can have a varying amount of EXE files at their disposal. 
These characters are the first on this list to be considered malicious by disabling the task manager retrace tier characters, which either completely or partially overwrite the enemy's files, anti-malware tier characters, which can either run semi-automatically or automatically making them far more dangerous than frost tier characters. There are various sub-tiers, currently known are the alpha tier that relies on autorun.inf and the beta tier which modifies the user's registry to open on startup. There is an even higher tier but is undisclosed as of now, dragon tier characters, which are really dangerous viruses disguised as characters. Dragon tier characters often simply make the computer inoperable by various means, and may be able to end the cheapy war entirely. Fortunately, dragon tier characters are rare. Mathras can be shown as an example of a dragon tier character. This shit is so funny to me, it literally doesn't even sound real. I did a little digging into this Mathras to see if he was a real character. Here's a supposed screenshot I found of it. As you can see, it's not even an original asset, it's just a red fellhound from Warcraft. Here's a video I found on YouTube, supposedly of Mathras, but I'm not certain if this is actually footage of the original or just some sort of recreation or what. I mean, if it was footage of the actual character, shouldn't it be like destroying the computer and shit? Supposedly this is the character who single-handedly ended the Cheapy Wars. If it was real, I couldn't find a link to it, but you'd better believe I downloaded a potentially computer-destroying virus just for a YouTube video. Until they invent a computer virus that can actually kill you, I'm gonna say this is as close as we're gonna get to a real-life creepypasta. I mean, your computer getting destroyed is pretty close to dying, right? I guess it's time to grow up and realize that no matter how much you may want a spooky ghost or goblin to come out of the TV and kill you, it's just not gonna happen. And that's the end of that video. Now time to play some video games in the dark, as is tradition for YouTubers after talking about creepypasta. Boy, I sure hope nothing spooky happens.